For those of you who are first time visitors to the PEF, we are um, a learner society. It's a research organization for the study and understanding of the Levant's rich, tangible, cultural and natural heritage. Established in 1865, during the colonial era, our own history is inevitably entangled with the history of colonial exploration in the region. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this history, this history and its impact on the inhabitants in the region and on our understanding. In these talks, we often explore themes which are at least in part relevant to understanding that history better. And it's very true of tonight's talk, I think. About a year ago, we had a really lovely talk from Andrew Lawler, the author of another book on Jerusalem, Under Jerusalem, which, uh, in which he traced the story of the exploration of Jerusalem's past and the consequences of that exploration. And one of the themes that came out of that talk and in his book was how um, alienated the inhabitants of Jerusalem were from that exploration. So whilst they may have taken part in the odd ex uh, excavation, frequently taking part in excavations, they very often didn't have any direct agency, any decision-making power over what was explored, how it was explored, the terms and conditions under which it was explored, and so on. And so the story of Jerusalem's past has been chiefly written by outsiders for their own purposes. And even the four quarters of Jerusalem we're so familiar with, the Christian, the Muslim, the Armenian, and the Jewish, are really a 19th century Western pastiche. It's not real. It doesn't reflect the, the lived lives of the people who live in Jerusalem. That's an awful lot of living, I grant you. And so whilst thousands of books have been written on Jerusalem, I'm pretty sure most of them have been by others, pilgrims, academics, novelists, soldiers, travel writers, journalists, missionaries, and so on, but rarely about the inhabitants themselves. Matthew Teller's Nine Quarters of Jerusalem tries to begin to redress that balance, telling some of the stories of those inhabitants, giving us a rare insight into the lived realities of life in the world's holiest city. And what is clear is that Jerusalem's communities are far more intertwined and far more complex than this rather reductive ge geography suggests. There are communities that the visitor is almost entirely unaware of, and systems and relationships which keep the city ticking over even, the most ex even in the most extreme of times, despite the odds. So tonight we're very fortunate to have Matthew here to talk about those people and his experience in writing about them. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Felicity. Um, and to colleagues at PEF as well. And thank you also to everybody for coming out today as well. Um, uh, Felicity's int introduction has touched on many of the themes of the talk um, that we'll be seeing over the next uh, 45 to, to, to 60 minutes or so. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to flesh out some of those and I'm very happy at the end of the talk um, to have a QA and a if there are any questions that do arise. That would be wonderful. Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem's not my city. Um, and it never will be my city. While I was researching um, and writing this book, I was very aware of 150 years, maybe more actually, 175, 200 years of people like me, white, English speaking, middle-aged, middle-class, well-educated uh, men, in particular men, claiming Jerusalem for themselves, for their nation, sometimes in Britain's case, for their empire, sometimes for their religion, Christianity and then proceeding to tell everybody else, often at great length and often in print, why their claim mattered so very, very much indeed. That's not why I've done what I've done, as I hope you'll see if you get a chance to have a look at the book. I'm not a scholar, as Felicity said, I'm a journalist. I wrote this book because I could see an imbalance in narratives about Jerusalem, in my culture, English-speaking culture. 
um, because of my work as a journalist and an author and a producer for BBC Radio 4 and other things as well, I'm lucky to have a platform from which to speak. And I wanted to use that platform to help redress the balance. But it's a tricky word, um, balance. We hear it most often in relation to the news media. And it conjures these images of a seesaw. Um, it implies there are two sides. Um, and in this case, uh, the sides would be, you know, one Israeli side, which is very often conflated with Jewish, and a Palestinian side. The wisdom runs, if you devote equal resources to both sides, the seesaw will end up level, you know, you will have achieved balance. Um, but as I set out to show in this book, Jerusalem has many more sides than two. It would be misleading to reduce Jerusalem to two sides. That idea of two sides and ideas about two sides being irreconcilable are a fiction. And any balance that may result from treating two sides equally will never be an equitable balance because Israel has the overwhelmingly larger proportion of resources, assets, status, power, money, visibility. The seesaw is not level to begin with. So to achieve an equitable balance, you have to act unequally. So in this book, I haven't taken equal numbers of stories about Jewish Jerusalem and Jewish people and everybody else. The book favors those who begin with fewer advantages. I'm choosing to amplify the voices of the unlistened to. I'm very, very lucky indeed to have been visiting Jerusalem uh, since I was a child, which is an awfully long time ago, um, 40 plus years ago. My first visit was in 1980. Um, and then in 1982, my father, amazingly, arranged for me to have my bar mitzvah twice. Once in the synagogue that we went to at home in South London in Croydon. And again at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And I've been coming back all my life, traveling, living, working, visiting. This is an image um, of the old city of Jerusalem, which I'm sure everybody will understand, is the, uh, it's the walled area at the center of the wider city where most, not all, but most of Jerusalem's holy places are concentrated behind those Ottoman era stone walls. I should add that it's not a big place as well. The area inside the walls is less than half of one square mile. About 35,000 people live there, 90% of whom are Palestinian. So one motivation for me for writing this book was, on all those visits over my teens and my 20s and my 30s and my 40s, was seeing how people like me, tourists, outsiders, visitors, pilgrims, would encounter and almost inevitably marginalize the people who live and work in the old city beside the holy places. Because Jerusalem is the most famous city in the world, many people, perhaps even most people who visit, come either with an idea of what it should be like or expecting a place of spiritual perfection. And the people who stand if you like, between me and my holy place, people come with a tick box. They want to pray at the church or, or, or visit the mosque or kiss the Western Wall. And the people between me and my holy place are very often seen as an impediment. They get in the way. I have the, the, the culmination of my spiritual journey to, to achieve. And I have to navigate all of this stuff in between. Why? It shouldn't be there. Um, that's wrong, and it's, it seemed wrong to me over all those trips as well. And I thought for a long time about how to write about that, how to pull apart those ideas. Another motivation for me was seeing how the reality of the old city didn't match up to the maps that all the people like me, the visitors and the outsiders were using. And this is what Felicity hinted at before. 
Um, these are two images which I've drawn from the internet. These are from the news media, but they're very similar <coughs> to maps that we might see in a guidebook, <coughs> on a, on a, in, a, in tourist literature of some kind or other. Um, when they show the old city, they invariably, invariably show the old city divided into four, Christian quarter, Muslim quarter, Armenian quarter, Jewish quarter. Very often with these sharp, clear lines of division between. But as you'll know, if you've been there, there are no dividing lines between, say, the Christian quarter and the Muslim quarter. That line there, or the line on the, on the right-hand side, uh, it's a street, it's a market street. It's not very wide, it's maybe three or four meters wide. Uh, very busy, very lively, very colorful. There's shops on both sides, there's people moving around and shopping on both sides. There isn't really both sides, it's just a street. The sense of exclusivity that these sorts of maps convey is quite wrong. There are churches in the Muslim quarter, there are mosques in the Jewish quarter, there are people living everywhere. But people approaching Jerusalem for the first time might imagine that these quarters are somehow holy. This is a holy city. Has it been divided holily into holy quarters? That's a mistake. But from that mistake, then it's a short step to the next mistake, which is thinking that perhaps Christians say aren't even allowed into the Muslim quarter, or the Jews may not enter the Armenian quarter. So then you have a situation where a Christian visitor, say, to Jerusalem, thinks that the Muslim quarter, say, is somehow enemy territory. It's not, it's not mine, it's not, it's not my people. I should stay away, it's not for me at all. Which is quite wrong, the whole thing is wrong. These sorts of maps um, are a very Western conception rooted um, in ideas of the nation state. They look uh, to me like a sort of atlas of Europe where all the countries lock together very neatly along sharp lines of, of, of frontiers. Um, last year, my um, American publisher very kindly sent me on a, on, a, on a book tour around the US. And I was thinking about how to translate some of these ideas for a US audience. And, it, and I was thinking how particularly that this map on the right reminds me of a place in the, in the Western United States where four states meet, Utah and Colorado and Arizona and New Mexico, all meet at a, at a sort of four corners point. And then I thought a bit more about that. It's quite instructive because what's invisible in that formulation are the Native American lands of the Navajo and the Hopi people and other people which were erased by the US state borders. And in a similar way in the Jerusalem context, these maps also erase an indigenous reality of the city. So where did this idea come from? I started to try and do some research. Now the study of early cartography in Jerusalem is a very specialized and profound topic, um, which I reduced to one single image for tonight. So um, excuse the uh, skating over the surface here. Um, these are just four um, examples of early maps of Jerusalem. The one at the top is the oldest map um, that survives today. It's the mosaic, which is laid on the floor of a church um, in what's now Jordan. Uh, that's the 6th century. From then, all through the Middle Ages, Jerusalem is very often depicted in this idealized form, uh, sometimes as a perfect circle, which is drawn from the uh, biblical reference to, um, to Omphalos, to the, to the navel of the world. Um, or sometimes as this sort of European style castle fortress. Maps were idealized representations of place. People would travel by word of mouth, using local guides, using local knowledge, using local, uh, local routes and local resources. Maps were very often drawn when you return home safely after your long and dangerous journey. And very often they were used as a, as a way to depict how either an individual or sometimes a community as a whole conceived of a journey and its destination. But equally, all through this era as well, there are Arabic sources that speak of Jerusalem as not as a fortress or a castle, as a mixed cluster of neighborhoods. One historian talks of 39 quarters of Jerusalem in the 13th, 14th century. Another one 
describes 18 quarters in 1495. These were organic, these were neighbourhoods that had developed from the bottom up. And that situation lasted through to Napoleon. So in 1798 and 1799, Napoleon invades first Egypt and then Syria, uh, of which Palestine was a part, as well as military forces. He brings with him a team of artists and scholars and scientists and explorers. There's this surge of interest in Europe in Arab and Turkish culture, which lasts pretty much till today. Very shortly afterwards, we see the first map of Jerusalem published based on measurements, not uh, with Jerusalem depicted in this idealized form, but based on measurements taken in the field. And that's this one from 1818, um, produced by uh, a man called Franz Zieber, um, who was a botanist from Prague. There's um, an awful lot to say about this map. Maps, old maps in particular, as Felicity <laughs> And testify from my roaming around the library this afternoon um, are extraordinarily powerful documents and objects. I'm just going to focus in on what I'm the story that I'm telling today rather than going on about um, the glory of this particular map. What I've highlighted in the middle there is the only label that refers to ethno religious settlement in the city at this time, which is Judenstadt or Jewish city, Jewish area, Jewish quarter. This one is the next major advance in the mapping of Jerusalem. This is from 1835, an English explorer, Frederick Catherwood. And again, there's lots and lots to say about this map, focusing on the story I'm telling. Again, the only quarter that we have is Jews' quarter. But now we start to see, it's hard to make out, but there are labels for the Armenian convent and the Greek convent and the Latin convent. These are areas of Christian settlement around these particular churches, which reflect the concerns of Europeans who are starting to encounter and explore Jerusalem in greater numbers for the first time. And then came a map in 1837 by Hermann Engel of Vienna. And we have a Jewish quarter again, but now we have a Turkish quarter, a Greek quarter, Armenian quarter, Latin quarter. As far as I'm aware, this is the first time that these names appear on a map. And this period, the 1830s, was a time of political upheaval in Jerusalem and in all of Palestine as well. There had been a rebellion led from Egypt, which had challenged Ottoman rule. There was a popular uprising in Palestine, which led to a power vacuum. European powers were jockeying for position, trying to restore order, but also trying to take advantage of the instability to advance their own interests as well. This is a period when we see foreign consulates opening for the first time in Jerusalem as well, including the British consulate. And then in 1840, Britain, after a failed diplomatic initiative, did what Britain does in other periods and other times, essentially bombed Palestine into submission and handed it back to the Ottoman authorities. But British forces remained. So there was a team of royal engineers who were tasked with surveying the terrain of Palestine up and down the coast. And in 1841, two of them, Lieutenant Edward Aldrich and Lieutenant Julian Simons arrived to survey Jerusalem. But the conflict of 1840 wasn't just about geopolitics. British Protestant evangelical missionaries had long had their eye on the unevangelized people of the Ottoman Empire. They were unable to convert Muslims because Ottoman law at that time stipulated death for people who converted away from Islam. They were unable to convert Catholics or Orthodox Christians, <coughs> partly because there was little willingness in those communities to convert, and also partly because France protected Catholic rights and Imperial Russia was protecting Orthodox rights. This left Britain out in the cold somewhat. They had nobody yeah. to protect. Britain wanted a <coughs> religious excuse to intervene in Jerusalem, and also a diplomatic excuse to seek privileges from the Sultan to match the status of the privileges that had been afforded to France and Russia. There had long been, and there still is today, a strain in Protestant evangelical thinking that sees the conversion of the Jews <coughs> as being a prelude to the second coming of Christ. At this time, we see British efforts going into converting Jews, which meant 
that the Brits needed to know exactly who lived where. And we see that Britain at this time appointed the first Protestant Bishop of Jerusalem, who was a man called Michael Solomon Alexander, formerly a rabbi who had converted to Christianity. He arrived in 1842 and with him was a young chaplain, a man called George Williams, who was aged only 27 at that time. And he was only in Jerusalem for just over a year or so. He was posted elsewhere. In 1849, he published a new edition of his book, The Holy City, and it included a map which had been drawn from the survey done by Aldrich and Simons of a few years previously. But Williams added all the labeling to it, including Christian quarter, Muslim quarter, Armenian quarter, Jewish quarter. As far as I can tell, and as I said, I'm a journalist and not a scholar, but as far as I, my research has led me to believe, George Williams, age 27, was the instigator of the idea of dividing Jerusalem into four quarters. Maps before him did not show them. And just about every single map ever made since does show them. I won't bore you, but I could go through a tide of maps from the late 19th, early 20th century produced by European and American cartographers all of which include these four quarters. There's a direct line from George Williams in 1849 to the maps of Jerusalem that we all see and use, reinforced in the media and in literature and in academia and in guidebooks and on tourist maps, in every conceivable medium. Why has this idea of four quarters survived? Well, as the work of, of an increasing number of historians um, people like Selim Tamari, Vincent Lamaya, um, Michelle Campos, Sarah Irving, Roberto Mazza, Yahya Wallach, and, and others as well, whose, whose work is the, is the foundation of anything that I've done myself. As they're now showing, it survived because it suits the colonial ambitions of successive waves of the rulers of Jerusalem from then right down to our own time as well. The quarters are false. They were invented by a 19th century British Old Etonian missionary. They always were false, but it suited Jerusalem's colonizers to divide the city's populations against themselves to foster sectarian division. Williams himself, this is an extract from his book, was even aware that he was deliberately marginalizing the lived experience of Jerusalem's own people. If you remember the, the 39 quarters from the 13th century, and the 18 quarters from 1495. And even today, if you think of all the communities, all of the different ethnicities and religions and social identifications of people who live and work inside the old city of Jerusalem, for Williams and for all of Jerusalem's map makers since, they are all, as it says here at the bottom, numerous but unimportant. Um, I beg to differ. <laughs> Those subdivisions, which reflect the, the mixed nature of the city's population, are extremely important. As a journalist, I'm specifically interested in how we think of Jerusalem when we only ever see it depicted as being divided into these sectarian ethno-religious quarters. There's also, I think, also a further discussion um, to be had here about the origin and the nuances of the English word quarter and its equivalence in Arabic. It's also Another point is very interesting how Palestinian Jerusalemites tend to fall back on using the four quarters when showcasing their own city for outside consumption, even though they themselves in Arabic don't use those designations. Uh, there's another fascinating question as well about why the British gave the Christian Armenians their own quarter, even though the area is much smaller in size and the community itself is much uh, smaller numerically than all the other communities that form these quarters as well. But maybe these are topics um, that we can come back to. The key point is that Jerusalem was not divided. Populations, of course, had always clustered. Christian communities would cluster near the church. Uh, particular tradespeople would, would, would live and work in, in proximity. Um, sometimes people who had arrived in Jerusalem from an, uh, another locality would stick together when they got there. But the exclusivity, and particularly the sectarian exclusivity, expected by the British and others, wasn't there. 
This, um, if you don't know this book, this is a marvellous book. I would strongly recommend you get hold of this book. Um, this, uh, this is the musician and the diarist, Wasif Jaukariya. Um, he lived uh, several, de four or five decades after Williams, after George Williams. Um, and his diaries evoke the ordinary life of Jerusalem at, in the very end of the time of Ottoman rule and into the British rule as well. Um, it's a marvellous book. It's his, his way with words and his way, his observations and his uh, navigation through the social byways of Jerusalem at this time is fantastic. Um, the Palestinian scholar Selim Tamari, who edited um, the Diaries for Publication, wrote about the evidence offered by Jauharia of a city in which, as he says, the social structure was much more fluid than is generally believed. That picture um, that this book paints is, is of a dynamic social mix. Religious festivities were shared across confessional lines. Then these uh, layered identities uh, reject, refute the British imposed notion of exclusivity. Um, but the British themselves um, don't show much understanding of that. Um, their evangelizing mission and the general expansion of Protestant uh, religion in Jerusalem is inextricably linked with the expansion of British colonial intervention. This is William Thompson, Archbishop of York, speaking in 1865 to a public meeting in London marking the foundation of this very institution, the Palestine Exploration Fund. Um, and he says, quote, this country of Palestine belongs to you and to me. It is essentially ours. That land has been given unto us. And he goes on further on. Um, it's a sacred duty to rescue from darkness and oblivion much of the history of that country. Obviously, I'm not being fair by extracting a couple of inflammatory lines, um, but uh, it does reveal to us that uh, we now know that Palestine belongs to the Archbishop of York. So. <laughs> um, Laura Robson, um, who is a professor of history at Penn State University, um, wrote quite interestingly about this, um, which I'm quoting a couple of paragraphs from her. She says, quote, the evangelical Protestant worldview did a great deal to determine the nature of the encounter between the British and the local Arab populations in 19th century Palestine. It determines the British focus on local Christian and Jewish populations rather than the much larger Arab Muslim community. Furthermore, it assisted the emergence of an understanding of Palestine as a place whose significance lay primarily in its Christian and Jewish heritage, an idea that would be used from the mid 19th century onwards to legitimize a British political claim to the so-called Holy Land. The British understood their presence in Palestine, not in relation to Palestine's inhabitants, but in relation to Christian theological debates and great power politics. So end quote, those internalized assumptions about what Jerusalem and Palestine mean still persist. We can see them in skewed declarations and flawed policy making right up to today. Now, I wasn't sure um, that I was going to do this little section here, um, but I am going to do it. I'm going to pull away just for four or five minutes um, to illustrate um, in quite a compelling way. It's compelling to me anyway. I hope you find it compelling as well to illustrate how loading unconscious assumptions onto people and places um, is still very much alive today. So, hold the idea of Jerusalem and Palestine in your head, and for four or five minutes, we're going to talk about something else. Or I'm going to talk about something else. Imagine that you're in a city. London could be a city. Could be the city that you're in. There you are. You're standing on a street corner in London. And now imagine that somebody comes up to you. They could be a tourist. Maybe they're Japanese, say. Sorry, they say, you know, I'm a bit lost. Can you tell me which block this is? You want to be helpful. They're visiting your city. So you say, well, 
that's Dean Street in this case. There's Old Compton Street. Over there, that's Frith Street, and that's Bateman Street. But the person you're standing beside, he looks a little confused, and he points at the buildings behind you, and he says, but which block is this? I want to know where I am. You see, well, now it's your turn to look confused. Blocks don't have names, you say. You know, that's not how a city works. Streets have names. That's how you know where you are. You navigate around using streets. A block, a block is where the buildings go. It's just the void between the streets. Blocks don't have names. And the tourist shakes their head and they walk away. Now, imagine sometime later, you find yourself in another city, say Tokyo, and you're a bit lost. You are. And you spot someone standing on a street corner and you go up to them and you say, sorry, I'm a bit lost. Which street is this? The person obviously wants to help you. And they say, well, that's block 22 and this is block 23. And they smile at you. That's it, problem solved. That's a bit confusing, obviously. So you say to them, well, thanks, but What's this street that we're standing on? I want to work out where I am in the city so I can get around. But now you're both confused. So your friend says, look, that's block 22. This is block 23. Over there is block 14. That's block 15. There's block 18. That's how cities work. The blocks are where people live, work, where the houses are where the offices are, the shops, the cafes, the restaurants, those are the important bits. The streets are just the void spaces between the blocks. They don't have any names. So you can see where I'm going with this. These are two fundamentally different ways of understanding a city. I would bet that almost everybody here tonight, and maybe everybody watching online as well, will have spent all or most of their lives with the streets idea. But many cities, not just Tokyo, follow the blocks idea, or a mixture of the two, or some other completely different system as well. But you can see how these different conceptions of what a city is would influence just about everything about your experience of place, understanding what a city is, or a town, or a village, uh, how to think of one, how to create one, how to live in one about how the city's residents think of themselves and their location, the relationship between individuals and urban space, where human interactions happen, where commerce happens, which spaces are public, which spaces are private, and so on and so on and so forth. I, um, I recently got back from Tokyo, which is why I've been thinking about this. This has been ringing in my head a lot. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the writer Derek Sivers, um, who came up with that visualization of how to understand Japanese cities. I now realize that I went to Japan carrying a whole load of assumptions that I didn't even know that I had, such as about how a city works and which bits you name. Um, the 19th and, and early 20th century British, to come back to our story, also went to Jerusalem carrying a whole set of ideas about what they expected to find. And then they mapped their expectations onto what they saw. Unaware, perhaps also, you know, just like me and you in Tokyo, um, that that was not how things worked for Jerusalemites themselves. So to return to our map after our little five minute loop, um, I just wanna try and take in, if I can, some of Jerusalem's many, many marginalized communities of today. I was very lucky indeed to spend some time talking to and also writing about um, these people, people at the Indian hospice. Uh, and Jerusalem has many, many of these hospices, which um, in this context, a hospice is a, uh, a Muslim religious institution, specifically one related to uh, Sufism, to mystical Islam. Uh, this is a really fascinating um, it commemorates a legendary visit to Jerusalem 
uh, 800 years ago by Baba Farid Shakar Ganj, um, who is one of India's most celebrated mystics. And he's supposed to have uh, meditated here for 40 days. And there's still a cave and a small mosque inside um, the boundary walls of the Indian hospice compound, which is also now home to a little cluster of Indian Palestinian families. Or really, it's, it's one extended Indian Palestinian family. Just nearby is this place, the Afghania Hospice and the Bukharia Hospice, which are two buildings built uh, back to back to each other, which create this little community with a centuries long tradition of hosting Muslims from uh, Bukhara and the neighboring lands of Central Asia, Uzbeks, uh, Tajiks, Turkmen, Afghans, Uyghurs, and many others as well. Nearby to that is a neighborhood that's home to Jerusalem's Dom families who self-identify as gypsies. And that word gypsy has a troubled history um, in English. It was invented around the 15th century um, because English people were looking around at newcomers who were arriving amongst them. They didn't know who they were or where they came from. Uh, and they named them uh, gypsies as a truncation of Egyptians. They thought they came from Egypt. Um, and over the centuries, the word has taken on pejorative meanings to such an extent that today some people will choose not to use it at all. Um, but in English, the Dom of Jerusalem do choose to self-identify with the word gypsy. So I'm following their lead in that. Their history, which is um, inevitably, as with parallel communities elsewhere, very under-researched and very under under understood. Uh, their history begins with waves of migration about 1500 years ago out of, not out of Egypt, but out of India. Um, and some people were, were moving westwards. Some settled in Armenia and the Caucasus region. They are the Lom people. Some carried on from there into southern and southeastern Europe and then into northern and western Europe. They are the Rom or the Roma, as we would know them today. And some went further south into Turkey and Iran and into the Arab lands, what we call the Middle East, and they are the Dom. Lom, Rom, and Dom all share common heritage going back to India, and the Dom have lived inside the walls of Jerusalem for 200 years or more. Um, and inevitably, as, as with parallel communities elsewhere in Europe and other places, they suffer appallingly from racism and from discrimination. Um, they self-identify uh, neither as Palestinian nor as Israeli. They are Dom. They occupy a very constrained and tiny little socio-political space between the two larger communities. And inevitably they suffer um, as a result from both sides. Um, the Dom children very rarely graduate from high school. Um, unemployment rates within the community are very high, sometimes as high as two thirds. Jobs where they exist tend to be very low level service jobs related to uh, uh, public sanitation, cleaning drains and sewers and so on. Um, this is Amun Slim, amazing woman. Again, another person I was extraordinarily lucky to meet. And then she was extremely generous in sharing her stories and sharing insights into her community with me. Um, she's an extraordinary person. She's done uh, amazing work over more than 20 years, building community support networks among the Dom. She started in uh, 1999, distributing blankets and essentials to families in need. In 2005, she was able to set up a community hub in a building outside the walls, just uh, in East Jerusalem. Um, and she now runs vocational training classes for women, language classes, um, after school clubs putting Dom children through extra tuition uh, so they graduate from school and then move on to college. Um, she was providing vital support for her community during the pandemic as well. Um, and inevitably, of course, uh, in and of herself, she's not only facing discrimination from the Israeli municipality and from wider Palestinian society, but she herself is breaking gender barriers within her own community as well. She's challenging patriarchal structures of power within the Don. Uh, 
um, and her energy and her dynamism to keep going and to improve opportunity for her community is um, astonishing. She's an amazing person. Um, and I felt uh, very, very privileged to be able to, to write about her in my book. Talking of uh, people who are suffering from racism and discrimination, there's also a center of African settlement uh, right at the gates of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is a community of around 450 Muslim people who have their origins in West Africa and Central Africa. Um, this guy is Musa Qaus, who volunteers at the African Community Center there. While I was um, uh, listening to these stories and processing these stories, I was thinking about how all of this serves to reinforce the idea that if your history of Jerusalem doesn't include black history, Dom history, Indian history, or, you know, in its very broadest definition, Arab history as a whole, then you're not telling the story of the city. This lady is Maysoon. She is Palestinian, but her family originates from Morocco and Algeria. She's one of the very last remnants of Jerusalem's uh, Moroccan quarter, as was it, which was flattened by Israel in 1967 in order to create the huge plaza that we now see in front of the Western Wall. This is, um, to tell this story in full, uh, it's a long and a horrifying story. Um, I go into some detail in, in my book. I'm gonna give you, if I can, the short version with a few images um, today. Maysoon has her hand resting on the tomb of supposedly the North African mystic and saint Abu Madian, who, according to legend, was in Jerusalem in 1187, fighting alongside Salah Hiddin to eject the European crusaders. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. The dates don't quite match up. Maybe it was, in fact, his grandson, also called Abu Madian, who we have documentary evidence for having been in Jerusalem slightly later. It's a little bit hazy. But it was at that time that land was given over to establish a North African or Moroccan neighborhood in this part of the city. And that neighborhood thrived through to the 20th century. And here you can see a comparison image taken from the same vantage point, um, showing the Moroccan quarter filling the space that is now the plaza in front of Western Wall. This is another shot, also from the 1930s, um, from an elevated aerial angle showing the same Moroccan quarter in front of the Western Wall. At the time of the neighbourhood's establishment in the 12th century, the Western Wall didn't mean much in terms of Jewish religious practice. There's almost no mention of it in Jewish sources. Rather, it was and still is a Muslim holy place, traditionally the place where Prophet Muhammad tethered the winged horse-like animal Burak uh, that brought him to Jerusalem from Mecca on his night journey. And the wall became important as a Jewish holy place from about the 16th century, when the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman, who we know is the Magnificent, deliberately made Jerusalem more attractive for Jewish settlement at a time when many places in Europe were expelling their Jewish populations en masse. So there were, of course, always synagogues in Jerusalem. But before Suleiman, in this period, Jerus uh, Jewish public observance was restricted to the Mount of Olives, which is off this image to the left-hand side, and the Golden Gate, which is marked here. Both are outside the city walls, but they were as close as Jews could get at that time to the site of the former temple, which is where the mosque now is. What Suleiman did was to first establish a Muslim cemetery along the line of that wall, outside the Golden Gate, and that cemetery is still there today, to block Jewish prayer in that location. And then instead, I've kind of drawn this big looping arrow around he created a way to bring Jewish public observance all the way around and inside the city walls by opening access to a stretch of the Al-Aqsa compound's western wall over there, which is 
even closer to the site of the former temple. And the way he did it was by opening uh, a small alleyway bes beside the wall and behind the last row of houses in the Moroccan quarter. And this, uh, this is an image from 1931, uh, which was taken actually from the Graf Zeppelin airship, which was flying over Jerusalem at the time. Um, and you can see the alleyway that Suleiman opened in front of the Western Wall, and you can see the houses and the streets of the Moroccan quarter stretching behind it. Now, Suleiman didn't bring Jewish observance into Jerusalem out of the goodness of his heart. This wasn't a sort of grand ecumenical vision of harmony and coexistence or something. He did it for very clear economic and political reasons. But it lasted right through to the 20th century. So in 1948, there was terrible destruction near here, just off this image on the right-hand side, in the fighting between Jordanian forces and Zionist paramilitaries over the Jewish quarter. Homes were destroyed, synagogues were destroyed, people were driven out, people were killed, but the Moroccan quarter itself was not targeted. And Suleiman's alleyway in front of the Western Wall looked like this in the early 1960s. This is about 61 or 62. And then, in 1967, Israel bombarded and then occupied the old city. One day after the Israeli army seized the Western Wall, with this very famous image on the left-hand side, Israel's former Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion visited the site. And first, he said the old city walls should be pulled down immediately. And thankfully, that didn't happen. And then he said, the houses of the Moroccan quarter, which are just off that image, just by his shoulder there, should be demolished to clear space in front of the wall for Jewish prayer. A plan was drawn up the next day, June the 9th. And then the following night, June the 10th, soldiers stormed through the neighborhood, shouting, banging on doors. Men with sledgehammers started the destruction. And then bulldozers worked through the night. And then by the morning, there was nothing left. The whole neighborhood, which was 700 or so years old, uh, was rubble. People fled for their lives. One woman is reported to have been killed because she was deaf. And so she didn't hear the knocking and the shouting and the banging on the doors. And so she died when her house was demolished around her. 30 years later, an Israeli army engineer went on record in an Israeli newspaper saying that workers had discovered several more, what he referred to as Arab corpses, that night. Some were removed, he says, but others, he says, were just bulldozed into the dirt. So presumably they're still there today under the paving that's now forming the plaza in front of the Western Wall. I don't know. It's a horrible story. Um, but it's a story that I wanted to tell, partly because it is much less well known about than the story of Jordan's appalling actions in the Jewish quarter in 1948, where people had also fled for their lives in the face of widespread uh, destruction. So the building that Maysoon looks after, right on the edge of the plaza in front of the Western Wall, it's just about the only building to have survived 1967. It's an anonymous doorway, you go through the doorway, there's patterned tiles on a passageway. It's a small courtyard which is home to six families. You go up some stairs, there's a small mosque on an upper level where Maysoon takes care of the tomb of a saint, mostly ignored. A few steps away um, is the tailoring outlet of this chap, Sami Barsoum um, is his name. He's the mayor of the Syriac Christian community, not Syrian, but they are an ethnic group who originate in the borderlands between what's now um, Iraq, Turkey and Syria an area that's, that's more familiar to us as Kurdistan, but they're not Kurdish. Um, and they belong to a church which uses the Syriac 
language, which is one of the dialects of Aramaic, which was a lingua franca across the Middle East before Arabic. Um, and this image, just by itself, highlights the nonsense of that idea of exclusivity. Maysoon's house and the mosque that she looks after are in what's now called the Jewish Quarter, but she is not Jewish. Sami lives and works and prays within the boundaries of what's called the Armenian Quarter, but he is not Armenian. And this goes across community uh, lines as well. This chap is uh, Avi Yefet, who is the caretaker of the Karaite Synagogue, which is probably the oldest synagogue still functioning within the walls of the old city, originally established in the eighth century. And there's a fascin another fascinating story of the Karaite Jews um, who are rejected, self-identified as Jewish, but they're rejected as not being Jewish um, by all of mainstream Judaism and also the Israeli state as well. Very briefly, uh, mainstream Judaism draws two sources of divine authority for the religion. One is the written Torah, which um, is perhaps more familiar to us as the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, and the other is the oral Torah, which forms, uh, is formed by a collection of uh, commentaries and interpretations by the rabbis, which were collated and written down for the first time about 1500 years ago as the Talmud. So mainstream Judaism draws both as being sources of divine authority. Karaite Judaism rejects the authority of the rabbis as being divine and focuses solely on the written Torah alone. And that leads to um, a number of differences in doctrine and practice between Karaite Judaism and Rabbinic Judaism. Uh, one of which is, as you can see at the bottom there, um, if you go into the Karaite synagogue here in Jerusalem or in another community elsewhere, you take off your shoes, you leave your shoes at the door. The synagogue is uh, free of furniture, it's just an open carpeted space. And as part of the devotions, there are these forms of worship which are now explicitly banned in the rest of mainstream rabbinic Judaism, such as kneeling and prostrating, touching your forehead to the carpet in prayer. There are obvious, you know, intriguing parallels between Karaite religious practice and Islamic religious practice. Um, uh, but, uh, it's under-researched again and very difficult to work out. You talk to one side and they say, well, they copied us. And then you talk to them and they say, well, they copied us. Exactly who copied who, who originated these forms of devotion. It's um, very difficult to work out. And as I said, I'm far from being a specialist. Um, but uh, uh, the result is that hackles are raised by the presence of this uh, minority self-identified Jewish community, they're called apostates. Um, and as I said, the Israeli state, because, uh, because of its, its, uh, its rabbinic structures, also rejects their identity as well, which in a place like Israel, with mums, and these high ones <coughs> of, uh, of ethnic and identification, that's a serious matter. Um, Karamic marriage is still not in Israel, It's not, they're just, not to finish, if I can, um, just with this point. The Palestinians of Jerusalem are under intense pressure. Um, I don't have to explain to any of this here of, uh, about the significance of what Israel is doing in um, Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan and a dozen other places in and around Jerusalem to try and make life there untenable for anybody who is not Jewish. So, as well as for the people of Jerusalem, I wanted to use my platform to write this book for my own generation of onlookers. I'm 54, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, to try and tell them, us, if you like, that the stories that we, grew up with, about Jerusalem, about the Four Quarters, about sectarian division, about how this is supposedly a war of equals, about how it's that maybe an age-old hatred between religion <coughs> that can never be solved, <coughs> or about how it's a conflict between two sides, rather than <coughs> what it is, which is an occupation by one side and another. All of that is wrong. 
my generation, our generation, needs to change its ideas in order that the next generation will be better able to affect lasting change. So, you know, these stories of mystics and tombs uh, and all the different communities of Jerusalem, I mean, they're fun and I love them and they humanize the people of the old city, which is certainly one of my purposes as well. But another purpose of mine in writing these stories was to weaponize them. There's a job to do among us all in terms of addressing the continued viability of how far things have been allowed to go in Israel. And a good place to start that work, I think, is in reimagining Jerusalem without its full quarters. Thank you very much indeed for this.